Okay. Uh, morning. Um, so on Wednesday, I, I spoke a lot about some aspects of um, combine and inbreds to produce F1 hybrids within a species, for example. So a lot of varieties that we actually see on the marketplace now are F1 hybrids. Um, but beyond combining two parents for the hybrid benefits within a particular species or market class, um, we can get a lot of benefits from combining species. Um, so rather than intraspecific hybridization, we're really talking about interspecific or between species rather than within species. So the benefits of combining species, there are several um, that relate directly to breeding and genetic modification. Uh, the first one is that we can sometimes combine two species and create an entirely new crop type. Um, this is only the case typically if um, the species can be crossed sexually without any real issues relating um, to the crossing barriers or to the combination of the haploid genomes from each parent. Oftentimes, this is employed in fruit crops uh, because for the generation purposes, if we create an F1 interspecific hybrid in fruit crops, then it can be clonally propagated. So even if the combination of the species can be technically difficult, or it can be very difficult to create that sexual hybridization, um, because you can clonally propagate the F1, then this means that those uh, generation of the F1s, those problems aren't replicated. This is also true for um, a number of ornamental plants now. A lot of the new flowers and bedding plants that come on the market oftentimes do a difficult or quite complicated interspecific cross. This might involve techniques such as protoplast fusion or embryo rescue. But if it's possible to clonally propagate that F1, then you can have basically um, an entirely new variety or crop type. The second major use is going to be in the transfer of desirable genes or traits from a related species. Oftentimes you might work with a crop um, and you might be working with a particular um, problem like disease resistance and you might go to the germplasm collection and be unable to find any good resistance to that disease, for example. In cases like this, it's sometimes possible to find resistance genes in related species that with difficulty can then be transferred into the crop species of interest. Um, it's also potentially possible to um, bring in new or novel traits from related crop species that may not be within your species of interest, for example. Sometimes with molecular biology, it helps to make an interspecific cross when developing a mapping population also. Um, sometimes crops have a fairly narrow genetic base, and if you create a mapping population from within the species, you don't generate very much polymorphism for the mapping population. So sometimes an interspecific cross is made so that you can develop um, a lot more markers for that genome. Uh, this would be the case with a lot of Tanksley's um, earlier work, where he worked to develop um, RFLP maps initially for the tomato genome the populations that were used were a, a cross of cultivated tomato to uh, a wild relative or a related species, which was uh, Penelii, I believe. 
So it can help in increasing the genetic diversity of the population when developing markers for a mapping population. Sometimes it might also be useful to transfer um, traits from the cytoplasm of a related species also. I mentioned that a lot of male sterility is cytoplasmically inherited, oftentimes with the mitochondria. So perhaps moving uh, a male sterility system from a related species. This has been undertaken in um, at least three or four different crop species in the Brassica family. The first thing to note about trying to make an interspecific cross is that the ability to make a cross to related species is very, very limited. Um, even if crops can seem quite closely related, uh, oftentimes it is impossible to make a sexual cross between crops that might appear to have the same number of chromosomes uh, be quite morphologically similar. Um, this really differs um, depending on the crop species. Uh, if you work with a major crop like soybean, for instance, there's very few, maybe only one or two uh, related species that you could actually make an interspecific cross with. In something like Brassica, there are more than a dozen different crop species you could work with if you were crossing to something like Brassica oleracea. So this relates back a lot to um, the barriers for sexual crossing and perhaps um, outcrossing plants, plants that are naturally self-incompatible. Uh, there's more possibilities perhaps with interspecific crossing of outcrossing species than there are with um, self, uh, self-pollinating species just because of the mechanism of sexual propagation and the basically um, the origin, evolution, and domestication of these species. Interspecific hybridization is not a new idea by any means. Um, some of you may have heard of Luther Burbank. He's a very famous horticultural breeder from the 1900s. Um, during his lifetime, he created over 800 new varieties. He was highly prolific, basically had his own nursery and was self-funding for his own endeavors. Some of these still survive today. He did a lot of work with flowers and particularly many lilies and a lot of work with stone fruits, uh, particularly plum. Uh, but he was also involved in bringing, for instance, the red pigmented gene into the rhubarb germplasm, which is now the basis of most rhubarb that we see. Um, and also, during his career, um, developed the plumcot. So this is something that we've just started to see on the markets in the last five or ten years. It's actually um, very popular doing very well at the moment. Uh, so while the market has only become receptive to this type of crop maybe in the last five or ten years, uh, Luther Burbank was maybe a hundred years ahead of his time when he developed this, I think, back in the 1890s. So some of these ideas of creating new crops like a plum cot, which is basically a cross between a plum and an apricot, that can then be um, clonally propagated. So this idea is not new, even though the market perhaps wasn't there at this point in time. The variations in stone fruits um, are one of the better examples of where interspecific crossing has been used to create new species. In cereal crops, the 
um, the combination of uh, wheat and rye was used to form triticale, for example. That's an example of an interspecific um, crop that was developed in the agronomic side. But among the stone fruits, the plum cot is basically a straight cross between a plum and an apricot that then is clonally propagated. It is, of course, possible to take it a little bit further than this to kind of work with uh, some of these combinations of taste, size, color, and texture that you might see. So if you're in the store, you might oftentimes now see the term pluot, not plumcot. Well, while a plumcot is a direct cross between a plum and an apricot, the fruit breeders tell me that if you take a plumcot and cross it back to a plum, so you basically have apricot plum back cross to plum, it would then become a pluot where the plum is emphasized, where if you took the plumcot and crossed it to an apricot to pick up more of the apricot characteristics, it would become an aprium. There, there have been additional variations on these crosses which sometimes can get um, a little bizarre, almost like they're unreal. One of the newer crops is um, a nectar cockum, or ne nectar cotton, sorry. So this has um, nectarine, apricot, and plum in its background. So basically, you combine in the nectarine, the plum, and the apricot, and then you form in the uh, nectar cotton, which has this appearance. So you're really combining all of the different flavors of the stone fruits, um, and then releasing it essentially as a new market type. Uh, the combination um, of uh, peach and nectarine, although nectarine is really just a hairless peach for the most part, they do have very, very different flavors, of course. So now we're starting to see combinations of some of the genotypes developed in nectarine and peach, which are starting to be called uh, peacherines. Um, just to give one other example in the fruits um, would be the cross between a, um, a grapefruit and a tangerine to produce a tangelo. Um, yeah. So are most of these um, hybrids sterile? Or uh, it, it's likely that they would not produce any pollen. Um, but if you can make the cross and the F1 is, will grow, then you can clonally propagate it. Oftentimes, what you find is that if you take the haploid genome from two parents, you can combine them as an interspecific hybrid. But if you try to then sexually propagate that, the problems come when the chromosomes start to try and recombine. So the problems come after the F1 hybrid when you try to create an F2 or a back cross. And I'll actually cover this with three or four examples because I've worked with my program quite a lot with interspecific work. So how do they then get to combine three fruits? Or like, you know, interspecific hybrid, you get a sterile one. How do they work with that again? Um, typically, um, the F1s will be female fertile, but, the, um, but male infertile. So if, as long as you have a pollinator, if you need pollination, or in some cases, you might also be able to deal with parthenocarpy. Um, but the fruit itself um, does not develop from the recombined gametes. It develops from the maternal type. So as long as the two haploid genomes are kept separate, which they are in the fruit, but not the embryo, then it's not, going to, um, it's not going to cause significant problems. This is also the case which I'll talk about on Monday when I talk about triploid crops such as seedless watermelon. And I'll, I'll give more information there about the, the problems we have with chromosomal realignments.
um, and how they relate to sexual propagation beyond the F1, but not actual fruit production within the F1. Uh, I mentioned also that grapefruits with the origin in uh, Jamaica between the uh, pomelo and the orange. Some uh, crosses are not strictly interspecific. They're combinations of different market classes within a species. Um, there's a number of cases of this in Brassica. Um, broccolini is a cross between broccoli and Chinese kale. These are two subspecies of Brassica oleracea. Uh, this hit the markets about five years ago, but has not really taken off. Cicata were doing contracted acreage on it. And another one that hit recently was Broca flower, which is a combination of two subspecies, again, uh, broccoli and cauliflower. This, again, really failed to take off as a new market type. So when we're looking at interspecific hybridization, we come back to um, these problems of gene pools and how related they actually are. Typically, within the species, everything will be readily crossable to produce fertile F1s. When we go to related species, if we go to closely related species, we're normally moving into the secondary gene pool. And when we go to more distantly related species into the tertiary gene pool, where even with a lot of techniques, we can't uh, get a sexual cross. So um, in the example of common bean, which is a crop that I work with, uh, Phaseolus vulgaris is common bean. This comprises of a number of market classes of beans, red kidney bean, black bean, pinto bean, navy bean, snap beans, all belong to Phaseolus vulgaris. But there are, in fact, uh, well, there were 28 Phaseolus species up until three years ago um, when, um, when, there were, when some of the factors used in uh, determinant speciation were altered, and now there's 62 species of Phaseolus, just to confuse people. But there are four species of Phaseolus that are cultivated as crop plants. Phaseolus vulgaris, which is common bean, Phaseolus coccinius, scarlet runner bean, Phaseolus acutifolius, tepary bean, grown in Mexico southwest, and Phaseolus lunatus, which is lima bean. With common bean, we can cross into the secondary gene pool to coccinius, to an extent to tepary bean, but lima bean would be in the tertiary gene pool, meaning that uh, a sexual cross between common bean and lima bean has never been achieved, even though you might go to the field and think that lima bean is not so distantly related uh, from common bean. So why do these sexual barriers occur? Well, they occur for multiple reasons. The, the primary ones are the reproductive or the sexual barriers, which can be both physiological and cytological. The external barriers, um, such as differences in where the plants are grown, what time of the year they flower, um, these are issues that can normally be uh, accounted for quite easily in a breeding program uh, by just perhaps varying the planting times or um, growing them in a greenhouse, for example. So you can account for differences in adaptation to climate and geography uh, quite easily for the most part. So the real problems we have to deal with are physiological and cytological. Among the reproductive barriers, we have the uh, failure to produce a zygote with just simple self-incompatibility. Uh, resulting in either the pollination, pollen not germinating or not completely traversing the style. Uh, the second one is that we have a non-viability of the F1 embryos. Um, there's a number of factors that can come into play here. 
uh, the interference in parent in parent among the chromosomes, um, deleterious interactions between the genes and the, the genes of the male parent and the cytoplasm of the female, um, and quite a common one in plant breeding that is encountered is that when we, we make a, an interspecific combination, then the embryo has some viability, but it has a really bad interaction with the endosperm and the seed, develop, the seed development. And so while the embryo is technically viable, the seed tends to abort because of deleterious interactions with the embryo. The seed, of course, is formed from the maternal genotype. The, an, another one that it, I've found very common, in fact, this is uh, possibly a, a bigger problem in the crops that I work on um, than the actual creation of the F1, and that is that you can create an F1 hybrid, but um, if you try to produce F2 plants or back cross plants from it, that's when you start running into the chromosomal rearrangements um, that, that you don't see to quite an extent in the F1. And this is where you really start to get a breakdown of any interspecific cross you have. So in many of the projects I've worked on, we've had most of our problems trying to uh, develop back cross plants, not develop the initial F1 interspecific plant. There are a number of approaches that can be used to overcome some of these barriers. Obviously, when we look at the gene pools, the first one is the selection of the species. If you're looking for a particular trait, try and find the species that is most closely related to the cultivated type. Um, and only really go to the wild pools or the wild gene pools if you really have to. Because aside from the crossing barriers, you're going to have considerable linkage drag problems. So it's much better if you're looking at interspecific work, if you're looking at introgression of traits following interspecific hybridization, to do a lot of preliminary work to make sure that you have the, the best initial source plant for transferring that trait. Because you can save yourself a lot of work after the point if you do this. With breeding, sometimes it's just a matter of getting the right combination. And it's just a simply a matter of numbers. Um, that you do 50 crosses, you don't get anything. But you do 500 crosses, and you get two viable embryos that come from it. So sometimes it's about persistency. And I'll come back to that with an example in beans. Um, also, the genotype used, um, this, can, um, this can reduce the problems that you have. If possible, um, try and look through prior literature to find particular uh, cultivars, varieties that might have previously been used in interspecific crossing, because not all of them are as amenable to the cross as each other. Sometimes it's a matter of direction of the cross. And if you're doing an interspecific cross, you should always be doing reciprocal crosses. This means that you cross one of the plants, the male onto the female, the other the, uh, back in the other direction. So you basically do two-way crosses. Even though um, usually it's preferable to try and cross onto the a female that has a healthier seed type, for example. If you're using a cultivated variety, cross into a wild type. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to uh, get good seed quality crossing pollen onto the wild type. So sometimes it, it works better to use the cultivated type as the female. And in some cases, you may need to do a bridge cross, which means if the species is quite distantly related, and it's not possible to do a direct interspecific cross. Sometimes you can cross to a, a secondary or bridge species um, and then cross from this bridge cross to the species of interest. 
As far as some techniques that can be used during the actual cross itself, uh, sometimes if it's a non-viability of pollen issue, um, sometimes mixing of pollen, pollen grains can have an effect um, when it's mixed with uh, non-viable compatible pollen. Sometimes some solvents can be used to help break down self-incompatibility um, at the stigma surface. There's a number of techniques that can be published for breaking down incompatibility at the stigma surface. Some work with some species in certain situations. Um, I reviewed a paper recently where they were looking at uh, growing the brassica plants at high temperature coming into flowering uh, to break down the incompatibility. Um, but they found that even though that had been published as a means of breaking down the incompatibility, it, it wasn't particularly successful and certainly not more than bud pollination. Um, another approach that has been suggested is uh, CO2 enrichment, which reduces the incompatibility on the stigma surfaces. My predecessor, Mike Dixon, uh, used to claim that with self-incompatible plants, you could tie a plastic bag around the flower seam and put a small straw and just breathe into the bag. And that carbon dioxide that you breathe out would then help reduce the incompatibility on the stigma surfaces. I've never tried it myself, so um, how successfully it works, I'm not sure. Uh, sometimes some growth regulators or hormones to help stimulate pollen or pollen growth or fruit development. And you might also find, uh, if you're dealing with polyploid plants, that if you're trying to um, bring in traits from a related species, that you may actually have to increase the ploidy level of um, one of those plants to enable the cross. And I'll talk about uh, utilization of polyploids on Monday. But for instance, in the case of strawberry, which is an octoploid, if you take a wild strawberry, which is likely a diploid, they won't cross um, directly. But it may be possible to increase the ploidy of the diploid to a tetraploid, then a, an octoploid. So you could actually uh, change the ploidy level to enable the cross. Um, if all other methods have failed, uh, protoplast fusion is a means of uh, directly combining somatic cells as opposed to gametic cells. And I'll cover that a little bit at the end of the lecture. Lisa Rule in the department here is world famous for having worked in this region. Yep. In, in some cases, you can, um, because in so, it, it depends how, um, how the genomes separate. So for instance, in the, creation of, um, in the creation of triploids, you might be crossing a diploid with a tetraploid, um, and you create a triploid. And I'll really talk about the ploidy issues in a whole lecture on Monday. So it's not that it's impossible, I was just... I was, I was hypothesizing that if it's, if it's not possible, for instance, to cross a diploid with a tetraploid, it may be possible to double the chromosome number of the diploid to a tetraploid, and then you'll be able to make a sexual cross. So, no, it's certainly possible. Um, I, in fact, I've worked a lot with crossing um, tetraploids with diploids, as an example. Post-fertilization. So if the fertilization is successful, an embryo starts to develop, there can be a lot of um, other factors that can start to come into play um, that cause failure of the embryo or the seed to develop. Uh, this can sometimes be helped, again, with some growth regulators or hormones, depending on the plant type. Uh, a very common technique used in breeding, probably in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, still used to 
quite an extent even today is embryo rescue where we make the interspecific cross but the the seed aborts, aborts the embryo starts to develop but the seed aborts so what we have to do is go and um, excise the uh, immature embryo from the seed or from the developing seed and then move it on to tissue culture to basically rescue the embryo that would have aborted if it was allowed to develop on the plant. In some cases, um, you may end up with issues such as uh, root system development or chlorophyll development that can be overcome with grafting onto a rootstock, perhaps. So these are some of the approaches that can be used to uh, help gain that interspecific cross. In breeding of seed crops, the biggest use of interspecific crosses, of course, is to transfer genes or traits from related species. This is not easy. In fact, it, it can take a, a great deal of time, um, but the rewards can be considerable. Because obviously, if you can go and gain that trait within your species, um, it not only can be done, but it probably has been done. Um, sometimes, if you're working with a crop and a particular problem, and there's not really a solution to it within that species, you have to start looking at closely related species to be able to deal with this. Um, I'm just going to highlight three of the interspecific projects that I've worked on in my program over the last uh, seven or eight years. One of them is cucumber mosaic virus resistance in bean. Um, it causes a dark green blistering and vein banding, as you can see here. This appeared in the Northeast as an emerging disease in about 1999 appeared in New York in 2001. Most of the snap beans are grown in the Great Lake region. Um, estimates for the yield losses it's causing currently are about 10 to 20 million dollars in the 200,000 acres around the Great Lakes region. So it's not that the virus didn't exist before, but we have a new aphid vector that's spread in it. The, the resistance has been looked at in the past and by myself and another project and there has not been any resistance documented within the common bean species uh, following evaluation of these materials. So we ended up going to Phaseolus coccinius, and I showed you that diagram of the primary, secondary, and tertiary gene pools. Um, Phaseolus coccinius is grown a lot in northern Europe. It's an outcrossing bean type. Um, but I was able to find resistance within this species that wasn't present in common bean. It's in the secondary gene pool, so it will cross, but it crosses with quite a bit of difficulty. But if you go through the literature, this is the benefit of genotypes. A breeding line had been developed by Mark Bassett out of the University of Florida. It's a black bean. The line number is 5593. This was developed to reduce the genetic problems in crossing from Phaseolus coccinius to Phaseolus vulgaris, or common bean. It is a common bean, but if we do our initial cross from Phaseolus coccinius to this bridge line, then we reduce a lot of the problems in that interspecific crosses before we start back crossing to our variety. So make sure you use the right genotype in the initial cross. It doesn't have to be the genotype that you want to end up putting that trait into. It has to be the one that's going to form the most effective initial cross. Even with this, it produced normal F1 plants when um, 5593 and uh, Scarlet Runner Bean were combined. But when we tried to develop F2 or back cross plants, this is where we started running into problems. This is when, uh, in the F1, we have a haploid set of chromosomes 
from Scarlet Runner Bean and a haploid set from Common Bean that are together in the F1. But if we now try and produce an F2 where the chromosomes start to recombine with one another or a backcross where the chromosomes recombine as opposed to the two distinct haploid sets, this is where we start running into the real problems. This is what most of our backcross plants would look like even though the F1s were normal. You can see we're getting pretty ambitious with the pot sizes in this case. But here you can see this is 5593 times Phaseolus coccineus uh, times high style in that case, which was then crossed into our variety of choice. So you can basically run into a lot of problems if you're not looking at what you're doing. Um, you have to keep your eye on the ball, basically. When I talked about a case of numbers, sometimes you get the right combinations or the right recombinations, and sometimes you can get fairly normal plants will pop out if you plant enough. So this has a relatively normal type. This is the problems that we were dealing with uh, the lethal genes or the, the deleterious lethal genes that would not really allow it from, for the most part to go beyond the second or third trifoliate. Even if you're not able to recover semi-normal plants, sometimes you can baby through these, um, these really runty, weak plants. And in this case, you can see that it has a couple of flowers here. So in the case of this plant, we were able to harvest pollen from this back cross plant to make an additional cross. At that point, we were able to use normal plants. So this is the benefit of um, this is the benefit of you know being able to do reciprocal crosses among other things. We don't have to use this as the female seed parent, unless of course it doesn't have any viable pollen. Using this, we've actually now been recovering um, resistant CMV materials and. We're now moving this through to market, which, um, if successful in the marketplace, of course, could be considerable um, because it could save the Northeast 10 million plus per year, which over a period of time, um, of course, can be quite considerable. Highlighting um, the importance of just some really simple and basic breeding. Um, making an interspecific cross and being able to go to a related species. In the case of beans, it was possible to do it using that bridge genotype, and we didn't need to use embryo rescue. We were able to go through just using the right genotypes, and we were able to recover um, normal plants and transfer this resistance. In many cases, we find that the seed aborts. Um, and in this case, we'll typically try and use embryo rescue to rescue the F1 or the back cross embryo. This reduces a lot of the post-fertilization barriers. But the point of embryogenesis at which you harvest it is very important. If it's too soon after the pollination, you're just not going to be able to recover anything. And if you leave it for too late a point in time, then the embryo is not going to regenerate in a tissue culture. I had a graduate student three or four years ago who did some interspecific work um, with brassicas using embryo rescue as the means to transfer a gene from a, a very distantly related brassica species. Black rot is a um, bacterial disease of brassica vegetables. Starts, it, it comes in in a water droplet on the hydrothode, which is like a stomata on the leaf margin. The disease then follows with these V-shaped lesions and extremely damaging worldwide to all brassica vegetables. This has been worked on for 50 plus years by the public sector, the private sector, and every option, not just within brassica rollaracea, but also with closely related species has basically been tapped out. Um, so essentially, there is some multi-gene resistance 
within Brassicorolleracea. Now, Brassicorolleracea comprises of several market crosses, market classes of um, vegetables: cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, collards. They're, they're all subspecies of Brassicorolleracea. But some work has been done with germplasm evaluation, including in my project. And it turns out that there was a single gene in the mustards, brown mustard, black mustard, Ethiopian mustard, um, that controlled the two major races for black rot. But it was just a very distantly related cross and thought not to be possible to achieve. Uh, Lisa Rill had done some initial work trying to do protoplast fusion with Ethiopian mustard. But these, the products of these um, were difficult to get stabilized. So we actually tried a bridge cross, crossing um, Indian mustard to um, canola, which is another amphidiploid. Um, and we did a direct cross of um, brown mustard or Brassica juncea to Brassica oleracea to try and transfer genes from um, Indian mustard. You may be familiar with this picture here. It's the triangle of U or the Brassica triangle. All Brassica vegetables have a very similar history in their origin and evolution. Um, in fact, they're quite closely related to Arabidopsis and to an N equal to two chromosome plant. It's thought that this two chromosome plant became a hexaploid, so it became N equal to six. One of the chromosomes was lost in the case of Arabidopsis, but some additional chromosomes were, ga were gained in the case of the, uh, the Brassica crops. So you can see that Brassica nigra has eight chromosomes, um, 2n equal to 16. Um, Brassica oleracea, nine, and Chinese cabbage, 10. But they share a very, very similar history um, with their ancestry, and so all of these species are quite amenable to crosses and quite tolerant of things like uh, polyploidization and aneuploidy. In fact, as you can see here, that um, interspecific crosses between some of these species have formed amphidiploid crop species, um, which I'll talk about on Monday. So it was a very wide cross in this case. And crossing it from uh, a plant that was actually identified from the Vavilov Institute in St. Petersburg, Russia. So this is also highlighting the importance of germplasm collections um, and the use of maybe materials in international germplasm collections and not the US one. This would be the susceptible response of a Brassica ginseng. We attempted embryo culture with this, but uh, were unable to gain any success. The reason was that after the cross was made, um, the silic that contains the seed started to develop, but died off very, very quickly. And it died off too soon to be able to rescue any embryos from it. So in this case, we basically had to modify our protocol so after the cross, before the Salik's um, started to die, we actually harvested the Salik's from the plant and tissue cultured them for about 10 days. And so then rather than the Salik's dying, they actually continued to grow on tissue culture to a large enough stage that we were able to then rescue the embryos from the Salik's. So we had to, in this case, add an immediate, intermediate stage into the embryo rescue um, project. And when you start to get embryos, then you can transfer them to, um, to some medias that may control um, shooting and rooting, depending on any problems that you might have in the embryo. These can be controlled with um, hormones and sugar content, for example. The interspecific hybrids were um, male sterile. Some of them, in fact, didn't even have any anthers. Um, so this was a concern. So even though we were able to develop F1 hybrids through this modified 
embryo rescue approach. Uh, we had to do embryo rescue again for the backcross populations. And in fact, we were able to use some of these plants that were female fertile in this case to, um, to achieve the backcross. You can see this is the um, Brassica Jonsea parent, which was crossed in this case to a cabbage variety Atlantis. It was then backcrossed to a broccoli uh, to achieve the backcross one plants. And we're now working on these with some seed companies and developing them for the marketplace and trying to reduce stability issues with them. Had another student that worked on heat tolerant beans. This is one that was on that gene pool on the secondary tertiary gene pool side. Uh, much more difficult than scarlet runner bean, but extremely tolerant to high temperatures. It's typically grown down in the Texas, Mexican regions. Um, bean typically won't produce uh, pods above about um, maybe 27 degree centigrade night temperatures. Where tepary bean, we can find going up to 32 degrees centigrade or about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, higher night temperature, we're still able to get a set of pods. So this, of course, can help to expand the, uh, the regions in which beans are grown in hot climates. Uh, during the high season, beans oftentimes aren't grown because they don't produce pods. So the idea is to transfer heat tolerance in this case. We chose four tepary bean accessions based on the fact that, um, that they were day neutral. Many of the tepary bean accessions were uh, responded to day length. And so a lot of the times they didn't seed. So we picked some day neutral varieties that were heat tolerant. And in this case, again, we went to a well-published genotype from Seat in uh, Colombia which is Ica Piao. It's a common bean, but it's shown to have success with crosses to tepary bean. So this was a different genotype from Coccinius, but again, a bridge type for the original cross. Um, in the case of the F1, you can see that in this case, we only had one seed in the pod, which would not have formed a fully viable and functional seed. So embryo culture in this, it's possible to um, cross that barrier between tepary bean and common bean, um, which was really needed in that cross. But in, in the case of scarlet runner bean, we could do it with a direct sexual cross using 5593 as the bridge type. When we're working with these crosses, you want to check that you haven't got self-pollinations. This can oftentimes be done morphologically. This is common bean, this is tepary bean, and this is the interspecific hybrid. So oftentimes it's very easy to tell the interspecific on a morphological basis. Uh, even the flower type, for example, this is the common bean, Ica Piao. This is tepary bean, and you can see that the flower type of the F1 hybrid is about halfway in between. If you look at these tags, this represents the number effort in this project. The F1s were not so difficult to create, but in developing backcross populations, 3,128 crosses were made to create a backcross, of which 158 pods developed from 3,128 crosses, which we were able to recover 25 plants, um, most of which died without getting through to flowering. So sometimes it's a number game when you're working with these issues. And these tags represent all of those crosses that were made. Protoplast fusion is a way to break down the cell wall of somatic cells. And then in um, the presence of polyethylene glycol or an um, electrical field, uh, the cells can be caused to fuse mix in their contents, and then we basically completely bypass a sexual cross. Um, this has been used quite successfully in transferring cytoplasms for male sterility. 
Um, but it's also been used in a number of cases in, um, in developing interspecific crosses of ornamental types in particular, of combining the two genomes into a somatic cell, tissue culture in it, and then basically producing an entirely new uh, flower type for the market. So basically, you digest away the cell walls with enzymes, and then you put it in, for instance, polyethylene glycol, causing cells of two different parents to fuse and put their genetic contents into the same cell, which you can then regenerate through tissue culture. So there's a lot of issues involved with interspecific crossing. It's not just the crossing issues that have to be dealt with, but it's also then the challenges that you may have to deal with after the fact. Considerable linkage drag, if it's quite a wide cross. The time it can take to get it into a cultivated variety can be decades. You may end up dealing with aneuploidy issues. I know I certainly am in the Brassica project that I talked about with black rot. Um, and also, you can end up, if you're transferring a trait or gene of interest, you can end up with a lot of um, pleiotropic type of effects in particular, where the trait that you're bringing in can seriously affect the expression of other genes. So that's what I'm going to cover on interspecific crossing. Obviously, again, I could go into a lot more detail on this, uh, but it does lead to some extent into Monday's lecture where I'm going to talk about polyploids and that will really um, deal with a similar type of topic in the fact that it's going to be combining uh, plants of different ploidy levels and um, different species of